This is Coda Radio, episode 139 for February 2nd, 2015. Hi everyone and welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. My name is Chris and normally at this moment in time I would introduce you to our excellent host on the East Coast, but unfortunately the East Coast is not so excellent this week, so Mr. Dominic is out, he's stuck on a train on a train, which is almost seems appropriate somehow, because he's kind of low-tech, he doesn't have cell signals, he's, it's like, he got an email out to me, and then like, his sig- he's gone. He's gone, he's off the map, it's weird. So, uh, it, we're gonna, what we decided to do instead is we have a great show lined up today, and my, it was his Mike's suggestion, so to his credit, he said, go on, soldier without me, and so we decided we'd have an open mic edition. Not, not, not Mike Dominic, but like the microphone, open mic edition of Coda Radio. Uh, and we got some great topics. We got a great turnout because I put out a plea on Twitter just a few minutes ago. So let me introduce our Mumble Room. Time appropriate. Greetings, Mumble Room. Thanks for being here. Hello. That was your moment. But I had, I, I had you muted like a jerk. Sorry. Not to make that anticlimactic. Hi, guys. Thanks for being here. <laughs> All right. Hello. So when I when I introduced you, I had you muted because I didn't want you talking over my intro. But now you're all here, and we got a great turnout. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and some of you got here at the last moment, like Eric. I was like, hey, anybody want to come join? And Eric joined us. And uh, I know some of you have some development experience. We were talking about that during the pre-show. So I think we'll have a good rounded conversation as we get going. So why don't we start? We just have some emails to get to, and we'll do these kind of quick uh, before we get into the main stuff, so uh, Cole wrote in, uh, and he says, uh, "Appreciating." He wants to do, he wants to touch on appreciating Ruby. He says, "I've been following Chris's journey to select his first language, and I heard him say he chose Ruby. That's great. I also have recently decided to pick up Ruby for the second time, and I'm finding it has a lot of functional elements to it." The first time I tried my hand at Ruby, I found it frustrating because I felt the syntax was superfluous compared to Python. I was coming from a Python background at the time. I didn't realize the extra syntax was due to Ruby having more functional features like symbols, lambas, mil- mutators, etc. Monsters in there too, I think. I abandoned Ruby and learned all the other languages I wanted. Not long ago, I tried my hand at Culture. You know, it's a pretty good functional programming language but it's more difficult than a, tra- than a traditional object-oriented language. Uh, I recently ran across a project called Ruby Motion, the successor to MacRuby, which offered Ruby as a scripting alternative to Swift for its Cocoa APIs. I was inspired and began investigating Ruby Motion in Ruby. To my amazement, Ruby made a lot more sense after my exposure to functional programming. Anyway, I'm finding Ruby to be great, a great language, and I'm starting to realize that the hipsters aren't always wrong. Whoa! I didn't expect a hipster defense there at the end. Uh, now, I know there's a lot of directions. A lot of people have opinions out there. Uh, I, I just thought I just wanted to cover this one quickly because I just, it was a defense of Ruby because we're going to talk about Ruby here in a second. So there's one defense in. Now, hold on. Hold your criticisms because I think this is something that we can discuss in later, in later details in a moment. Uh, I, I wanted to instead file that. We'll pin that, put a pin in it, and talk about Plexus's email. And uh, I really had no input on this. I, I was kind of curious to see what you guys think as somebody who's not really much of a developer at all. Uh, but Plexus wrote and he said, good afternoon. Uh, I've been listening to your show for a while now, and I really enjoy the shows that you turn out each week. I have to say, Coda Radio is one of my favorite podcasts on the interwebs. Oh, thanks, Plexus. One idea for an episode that I thought would, I'd love to hear you talk about, the subject of math and coding, how they mix, and why math is important when solving problems with code. Personally, math and code intermingle in my job daily, so I, uh, as I do security testing. And I write certain low-level softwares. But I would love to hear if math has been, been a big role in all dev jobs or just certain uses more than others. Again, love the show. Thanks. So, Heavens, I wanted to start with you because I know you've, like you mentioned in the pre-show, had quite a bit of experience with this. Uh, do you think that uh, math plays an important, an important role when solving problems with code? In my experience, not so much for normal development. I'm kind of weird and I actually dabble in coding cryptography that's where math is actually important because it's good to be correct and secure otherwise it's a lot of string processing operating or interfacing with the like operating system or file system 
or you know server paths and doing string building most of the time or quite a lot of it otherwise math yes but it's not as big as you could get on by grade nine math i imagine or maybe what it. common wisdom might have you believe i sometimes do i've you know uh, my my grandpa who uh, didn't know anything about computers but always told me if you're gonna be a developer you gotta learn math and he didn't know what I are you gonna it. do just do the, the dimensions of certain I objects like squares or i gotta know, calculate my pixels for my icon i guess i don't know <laughs> yeah or you know maybe the rgb values of actual <laughs> addition but otherwise and the various mod here and there but Otherwise, it's not that much math of what I've seen. All of it is functional, well, functional in the doing things way, not actual Haskell mathematical pure functional way. It's, yeah, at uh, least that's from my perspective. Eric, I wanted to give you a chance to chime in about uh, from, you noticed you picked something up during a job interview? Yeah, I was at a group at a job interview for basically a customer service position. But what was interesting is the woman sitting next to me uh, started mentioning that, uh, you know, because we were t supposed to come up with something that most people don't, that it wouldn't be on our resume. She mentioned that she w got really into math and that led her into programming. And she is part of some sort of programming uh, coding group here hmm. in the Seattle area. So really? it was just really interesting that uh, met her love for math, you know, because she was started with accounting, but that led her into programming. Huh? Oh, yes. Most likely, the most important aspect is the domain that you decide to get into, whether it's genetics, chemicals, physics, like simulation, math, cryptography. It all depends on the domain, like special domain that you want to code in or get a job in. Uh, all right. So uh, before we talk about I said I wanted to come back to that Ruby discussion. Before we do that, I want to read an email about Perl. I wanted to we'll, we'll start talking about Perl and then we'll get into Ruby and I want to give Heaven specifically a chance to respond to the Ruby stuff. So it seems like before we sort of shift gears like that, it'd be a good moment to stop and thank Coda Radio's first sponsor this week, and that's DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up a cloud server. I've got a bunch. I thought I actually, you know, I thought I had, uh, I thought I had a lot of droplets, but my new co-host on the Linux Action Show, uh, that that man. That man has a lot of droplets, uh, and you, it's just so. Why not? Like when you, it's like it's totally changed the way I think about server deployments now. Uh, at first, I thought about it in terms of applications. Oh, I need an application. Now I think about it in terms of we're going to build something, and we need some some port infrastructure. We need a certain Linux stack. I'm going to use this route, and and actually now they offer FreeBSD as well, which is pretty phenomenal. DigitalOcean is so slick because you can get your server spun up in less than 55 seconds, and pricing plans start only five dollars per month. Okay, so that's less than one cup of coffee. Stopping by the like the Starbucks or going out and getting a burger a week, one a week once a week, and you've paid for an entire month of your own server up in the cloud that has 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And they've got data centers in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. But what I really love about DigitalOcean is this interface. This interface is so easy to use that it means there's no friction when it's time for me to go do something, even. I would say even like the UI of something like VirtualBox pales in comparison to something like this digital ocean droplet creation wizard. And just like that kind of like removing it, making it that much simpler, like not that VirtualBox is hard, but it's like, eh, I don't really feel like doing all of that. But with DigitalOcean, I've got droplets I can spin up new machines from, which is great. If I have like the perfect rig or if I have a rig, like I just love the way this one's set up, I just spin that back up. It's so great because it makes it that even quicker. If I need to do some DNS management, I know it's not going to be a big hassle. Like it's just really straightforward. And the great part is even though I'm not a developer, this API is so amazing that lots of developers are taking advantage of it and creating great applications. And if you are a developer, which you might be, you could also take advantage of that API. But here's the best part. You can try it out two months absolutely free when you use our promo code, Coder Digital. Coder Digital, one word, lowercase, gets you a $10 credit. Try out the $5 rig, see what I've been talking about. And what I love too is like, I started with a $5 rig and I'm like, oh, okay, this is great. This is really doing a really good job. Uh oh, guess what? This is extremely useful and now I want to do a lot more things with it. Well, it was no problem at all. I just went to the resize option, resize my droplet, double the size of RAM. The pricing structure is very simple. They make it very clear. There's no tricks. And it's really easy just to apply a balance to an account and let it run. 
And if you use the promo code Coder Digital, you get that ten dollar balance. You can try out the five dollar rig two months absolutely free. Go play with Core OS or free BSD. I'm not gonna judge. Hey, BSD sometimes gets something right. Check it out. DigitalOcean.com. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean. Thanks, you guys, for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. And thanks to all of our audience who uses the promo code Coder Digital when they check out at DigitalOcean. All right, so let's get into this Pearl topic, and then we'll get into the Ruby thing. So Scott writes in, and Scott says, is Pearl obsolete? He says, I just caught episode 138 where you guys are talking about Chris choosing Ruby as his choice uh, of language. He says, I myself prefer Pearl over both Python and Ruby. He says, yeah, I could give explicit reasons why. However, my purpose of this email is not to persuade you to choose Pearl, but I ask why it was never even considered. Even Coda Radio, episode 136, Ruby is not Pearl, you know, episode 136. It didn't even mention Pearl despite the title because I'm not a full-time programmer or a professional sysadmin. He says I work for a, uh, a, uh, bio, a bion information. I'm a bion informationician. A bion information Ish, titian. Bio information. Bio information. Bio information. Bio information. Information. Anyways. Bio information. That's all I can come up with. I'm wondering uh, what you full time computer guys, uh, you, the mumble room, chat room, etc., know that I do not. Although I don't think Pearl is obsolete, maybe I'm wrong. Thanks for producing all the shows. Huge fan of them. Uh, I will admit, I didn't give Pearl total consideration. Years ago, I did sit down and l- learn a little bit of Pearl. Uh, f- so I could automate some stuff, and then I g- figured out what I needed to automate, and I never took any further. It just never really grabbed me for some reason. I think I'm a little biased. I think I think of Pearl as an old thing. I think that's why I didn't really think about it, to be honest with you, Scott, and I'm sorry about that. I shouldn't have done that, but I, th- I think I d- didn't make it a contender necessarily because... I mean, a big part of I mean, the big part of why Ruby was even considered is because we already use it in house for some stuff. So I mean, that that was a big part of what started the conversation. And for some reason, Pearl just didn't draw me. Um, all right, so Heavens, I know you have comments about Ruby, and maybe you have comments about Pearl. I wanted to open the floor and give you a chance because you were kind of teasing that during the pre-show. Well, I don't touch Pearl with a twenty-foot pole. Now, why is that? It makes one. It made my eyes bleed too much, so then it actually detracted me from giving it a good chance. Wow, okay, okay. That's not hostile, yeah. sure. That's not hostile, no. <laughs> yeah, it didn't fit what I... It did not okay. look good to me, so I just kind of skipped it. Didn't click, all right. No, it's not for me, or at least it wasn't for me, and I was not forced to program in it in order to get paid, so I just gladfully avoided it, and I've never needed it yet, so... But... And the Ruby, I do consider Ruby quite good for beginners, okay. but there is a quite a few uh, pitfalls or gotchas okay. when learning it because they're when starting syntax. with Ruby. Okay, now especially consider coming from like a total noob standpoint. Yeah, from a total noob noob standpoint, you'll get caught up in things that don't really make sense mm. because there's a lot of Ruby is very high level and it's its strength and its weakness because sometimes it hides what it's trying to do by being so high level that there's corner cases that you'll it also doesn't make sense to me either like python's zero based indexing and ruby's one based indexing and then having to change the virtual machine and standard libraries in order to make it so then you mm-hmm. could do whatever mm-hmm. or the splat operators and how to do function definitions and modules and yeah it's just there's a lot of it there's a lot of stuff to learn and they expect you to kind of be very pro very quickly but there is a lot of it's i consider it easy because there's not a lot of extra stuff you have to type in order to do things Uh, okay there's a large standard library that makes complex things in other languages really easy so that's why it's kind of and I'm going to be honest, because I'm a little lazy, that's kind of appealing to me. Yeah, but it also prevents you from growing as a programmer by hiding what it's doing under the covers. So you can't actually get any sure, better. Sure, yeah, we've talked about the downsides of sort of magic. Yeah, that's the magic part of Ruby. So you would have to, like, either you're a Ruby pro and you just love your where you are in and love the language and you never have to look outside of it. 
you're fine. It's kind of like Apple. You're given a paradise to live in, and if you want to get out of it, too bad. Yeah, well, there's foreign function interfaces, so you could do C programming and link to C, and but it's interlanguage like, communication. It's not so great unless you're running on the same virtual machine, let's right, say. Right, right. That Iron, makes sense. I mean, Ruby or the Java Ruby. Those, then you get the Java virtual machine those or the .NET virtual machine. I mean, that certainly does seem like limitations of Ruby to be concerned about, but not in sort of the context of what I... So, heavens, here's... I'll give you... So, I got to start small. I mean, I can't be too ambitious. So, I have a lot of small things I want to do that are like simple markdown formatting, taking notes and formatting them and generating text files and maybe uploading them to Google Drive or Docs or maybe not or maybe checking them into Git or I don't know. But I have some basic workflow stuff I want to do. But if I was going to be really far out there crazy, eventually I would love to be able to write a a script or a, a little, a small application that would take a video file and a WAV file. And it would look at the audio in the video file and it would look at the audio in the WAV file and sync them up and match them because they'd be the same, but they'd just be from separate recordings. And then automatically drop the WAV file from the video, merge the file that it just matched with into the file, into the into the wrapper, into the MOV wrapper or MKV wrapper, probably be an MOV wrapper, and spit out a not re-rendered file, but just a replaced file in that same MOV container with a new audio file. But it Something that could do the analysis of the waveform and figure out how to do the matching seems like the really crazy hard part that uh, would be way beyond me. But that would pretty much be the most advanced thing I could ever see myself really wanting to do. So I'm not really so worried about the limitations you bring up there. Wow. That's like one of the most ridiculously complex things you could probably ever start with. Right. No, I'm not going to start there at all. Video frame analysis and then audio waveform analysis and somehow match like you don't even have an open mouth for the video frame to like when you're doing the irc chat there's nothing to even synchronize the right. audio with no it would have to there's be... no visual cues at all that you could use no and that's why i would be much much further down the road but i would wait i would basically just match the waveforms anyways so but i'm just saying like that would be way down the road that would be the furthest craziest thing i'd ever want to do uh jack you have an idea go, go ahead oh so uh if you were to Put in a piece of audio on both tracks that right. flipped. Yep. You could check the levels and then just match. Yeah. It from well, there. or I mean, I c- it could be anything. I could insert like. Uh, it is a jackass. And I could just find that and then match it up. You know, it, it doesn't have. Yeah, to be- you'd be able to do it that way. But trying to do like visual or right. code, video codec analysis and reconstruction of the frame. No, oh, no, no, no. Man, that makes me cringe, or no. that just sends chills up my spine. <laughs> uh, yeah, was- yeah. That's no. That's no good. No, I mean, I'm just kidding, because you know what, I'd love to, uh, yeah, it, I, I would love to be able to just automate a few things with that, but I will see. I start small. I start small with some text stuff, and I go from there. When it comes to text, my personal opinion would be, of course, Python, because it's got a very good strength when it comes to string processing capabilities, mm-hmm. and it, yeah, it is generally a little bit more performant when it comes to string processing versus mm. Ruby's virtual machine, at least one of the things I've seen it do. And this is hard. And it's a little bit more, it's slightly more verbose in the syntax, but it gives a little bit more power without trying to make you, with all too much magic. And there's pretty good bit manipulation in Python, I'd say, compared to Ruby as well. So if you learned Python first, you'd probably be able to, Learn a little bit more and apply it to more things versus the oh, Ruby man. case. Oh man! Oh man! Oh man! Oh jeez! But that's the only. Th- I'm not a Python lover. You're gonna drive the audience crazy. Though, they're getting they're yeah. getting crazy that I won't poop and get off the pot, and now you're getting me back on the pot. Well, I did learn Python and Ruby at the exact same time when I wanted to find a scripting language that I wanted to use. I didn't know which one to pick, so I said. Screw it! I'll just learn them both. All of the try the all, same. All of the yeah, languages. All, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't consider JavaScript at the time, but those are the two that were the scripting languages of, of popularity. So I just learned them both. Ruby seemed to be what I picked at the time, but now with Python three, it Python three does fix a lot or a few very core. 
problems that I think Python 2 had in the language. And huh. now Python 3 is a good language, whereas Python 2 is not. Huh. All right. Well, there we go. And I'd love to get the audience's uh, feedback on that. Uh, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, choose Coda Radio from the drop down. You've got to choose Coda Radio or else it doesn't go here. And uh, let us know. But I did have a pick I wanted to talk about. Uh, because this is something really cool that I, I'm really glad uh, Speed Ghost pointed out because I should have mentioned it earlier. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. It's called Waka Time, and it's an analytics system. It's open source for programmers. And uh, they feature uh, a whole bunch of plugins from everything from Vim to Sublime Text, even uh, Michael Dominic's uh, Xcode. Of course, Android Studio supported Notepad++, Firefox, Chrome, Brackets, Atom, everything. I say Emacs, Emacs, uh, TextMate, I mean everything. Everything supported, obviously. Uh, and uh, it's neat because you get a bunch of really cool analytics as to what you're doing. You also get to go up on their leaderboards, which is kind of fun. So you can see, uh, you can compare yourself to what other developers are doing in time and languages that they use. Oh, look at all this markdown, JavaScript. Oh, boy, I didn't even think about tra tracking for myself for markdown for the show notes. That'd be interesting. I might be a, com I might be a, com a com wow, look at all, wow, some of these guys, holy gosh. Oh my gosh, this guy has logged 68 hours this week. Holy smokes. Anyways, so uh, Walk of Time gives you full analytics. So, you know, everybody's always like uh, the Fitbit. It gives you uh, the quantified uh, self. You know, you get to track your steps and your sleep and all, your, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but this is more like quantified self for your work. And uh, I actually, I was trying to get a demo, but you got to log in. Uh, I actually find that to be pretty interesting. When am I productive? Because sometimes, you know, I have swings of productivity and creativity, and maybe this could give me some insights to that. And it's open source. Uh, they've uh, It's under the BSD license. Everything's up on GitHub. And uh, the other thing that's really cool about it, and the reason why I'm really glad that uh, SpeedGhost linked to it in the subreddit, is we uh, featured one of their co-founders on Women's Tech Radio episode 11 last week. Probably should have mentioned this in the show. So it's very it's fascinating, fascinating, fascinating because it's not a very big project. Uh, and they sort of took a leap of faith and started this, and they've seen some big adoption very quickly, like over a three-month period. And so it's very fascinating to hear a small open-source project like this that all of a sudden sees a big adoption and people have to decide, okay, am I going to quit my job and throw in? And what happens when they do that? And so far it's been a success, and so they capture that in episode 11 of Women's Tech Radio about walk time So I, I learned about it by uh, listening to that show. And then when I saw that it was submitted, I was like, oh, yeah, the Coda Radio audience would love this, even if they just only use the tool and don't listen to the episode. But I would recommend checking out uh, Women's Tech Radio episode 11. I thought it was a particularly good one because it's kind of fascinating to hear a success story around an open source project like that. Anybody in the mumble room tried it? No? Nope. Then go check it out and let me know what you think. Maybe yeah, but it is nice to hear about success stories. Yeah, it is really it's 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 amazing uh, to hear what to hear how they just how crazy it is, and I wonder if it's one of those things where we might be like, yeah, we got them at the beginning, really early on, and now they're all big. Could be it, that that might be the direction they're going. So it's a good episode to check out. All right, so speaking of Ruby, speaking of training myself, speaking of learning, let's talk about Linux Academy, sponsor of the Coder Radio program, LinuxAcademy.com/slash coders. Go there to support the Coder Radio program, but also get yourself a discount. They have a subscription system, and you're going to understand why once you check them out. They're always adding new content, and they have a huge catalog of existing content right now. They have step-by-step -step video courses. I actually was taking one just the very beginning of one. I'll tell you more about that here in a second, uh, right before the show. And it's really cool. It, 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 you can jump in depending on where your knowledge level is and just start. With the, with the video courses, I was able to sit back, watch the presentation, and kind of get an idea. But I could also have downloadable study guides I could take with me, too, if I was going to do some offline reading. And the courseware comes with their own service, so that's kind of neat. I'm kind of looking forward to getting to that. And they have courseware on all kinds of stuff. And what's really cool is if you do end up on a live server or you have some courseware that's really Linux-specific, you can choose from seven-plus distributions. The courseware updates to match that distribution. The virtual server they spin up for you to do the labs on also matches that distribution. It's totally slick. They have self-paced courses. You can go in there and say, I've got this much time available and just take advantage of that system and they'll give you little reminders as you need. Uh, and, and I also would recommend you check out their course on Ruby. That's what I recently started taking this morning. I, I just started it. I decided to take the introduction and I was very impressed. I think this is going to be really great for me. And uh, because honestly, 
I don't know if you're like this or not, but to me, the idea of doing something like this seems very nebulous. Like it's, this is something that I cannot really wrap my brain around. But I trust Linux Academy because I've had success with the, the, some of their other training courses, and I've heard so many success stories from the audience. And they tell me, I'm going to go through this in about five hours, five hours, 30 minutes. I figure, okay, I'm going to give myself six hours and take it nice and slow. That is, for some reason, that helps me close the gap. I can wrap my brain around six hours. Like that is, that is a defeatable foe that I can launch out on an adventure and I can defeat that foe. It is something I can identify. I can put it in my sights. It's a goal. And, that, and, and, and they've, they've given me the path. So that was one of the, I mean, that was really what slam dunked Ruby for me is not only do we have Ruby stuff here at the studio that's take, that we use on the back end for things, but it's really like now I have this path laid out in front of me. I know how long it's going to take. I know all of the courseware I need is going to be there. It's specifically designed to get started on Linux. So that's like they're going to walk me through getting a Linux Ruby environment set up to, you know, even to some of the basic concepts of the programming language, which is honestly where I need to start. And that's like that for all of the topics, all of them, OpenStack, Python, Android develop, PHP. Uh, you want to learn backup with rsync, you can go over there and learn it back. Docker, Vagrant, virtualization across the board, uh, things like Puppet to help you manage multiple servers, in-depth resources, live streams by the educators where you can ask questions, a great community that can help you when you're maybe feeling a little down, uh, certification success stories all the time, a great course, great courses on AWS. If you end up needing to deploy something on AWS, their scenario-based training around AWS is unmatched. Nobody's got it. They've got it nailed. Go over to linuxacademy.com slash coders. Go check them out. See why I'm so enthusiastic. And also, honestly, they can be your companion too. When you decide to take on something new, uh, it's really nice to know they're there. And that's why I think it just continues to be an extremely valuable service for me. Linuxacademy.com slash coders. Thanks, Linux Academy. I really appreciate it. So let's talk about a few things that blew my mind this week. Uh, number one, and then we're going to get into the one that I think you guys are most interested in. So let's start with the one that I'm the most interested in, and then we'll flip-flop. Uh, I, I want to know what's up. I think this was a story I picked specifically to talk to Mike, so I might try to pick his brain next week if he lets me. But Microsoft is investing in Cyanogen. Big. Uh, people familiar with the matter say that Microsoft is putting money into Cyanogen, which is building a version of Android mobile that is outside of Google's control. Microsoft would be a minority investor, roughly around $70 million, according to the Wall Street Journal, through a round of fi uh, equity finance raising that's going to go to Cyanogen. However, in the end, all said, it could be hundreds of millions of dollars because it could be multiple companies that go in on this. Now, the Wall Street Journal speculates this is a move to diminish Google's control over Android. Uh, also, a quote from Cyanogen's chief executive, Kurt McCaster, we're going to take Android away from Google. Direct quote, he said. We're going to take Android away from Google. Well, I guess, does anybody know whether or not Cyanogen Mod contributes back to Google in any way, shape, or form for the official Android release? I, I, let's assume maybe they do. Maybe they do. I mean, I'll back up to Aesop, I would assume, right? They're, to the open source version. Or at least maybe the tools. If they are able to give the contributions back up in some way or form, sure, it doesn't really matter where the money's going as long as it hits upstream sometime, but it doesn't. More competition is a good thing to me. Of course, the inverse of that question is, is Google willing to accept anything that Cyogenomod actually produces? Or if Cyanogen produces, you know, produces code and says, hey, you guys can take it, is Google just going, nah, no thanks? Yeah. Hmm. See, Hard to say. Uh, my question is maybe more like this. Isn't it too late? Wouldn't have this been more doable when the camera app that everybody was using was the open source one and when the web browser everybody was using was the open source one and the mail client everybody was using was the open source one and the photos app everyone was using was the open source one and the maps app? I mean, you get my pin. You get my point. Google has systematically replaced every single built-in app in the open source Android ASOP with their own play editions, and they are markedly better. Just about every sense. Like, they're all better versions. Like, they've even replaced the texting app with Hangouts. Full stop. They've replaced everything. The web browser with Chrome, through and through, it's all been replaced. And I think that's all been to prevent something like this. That is the control. Because Google is the only company that can tie those services in with Google's infrastructure, which has the now infrastructure, it has your mail, it has your, con it has everything, right? Because it's Google and nobody else can do that. And so as long as you want that, 
that's where the control is. It, I, mean, I can't see another way around it. Like cyanogen can, cyanogen would never have a successful m- l- wide market product if it had didn't have the play stuff. It did, if it didn't have all the play apps and the play services, right? Yeah, the yeah play I, is completely like pivotal when it comes to their success. And I think the actual handset providers, if they had the choice of going with Google's Android or CyanogenMod, are going to go with Android from Google because they know that their clientele, the customers, want that integration. Well, and Google's carrier grade, Cyanogen's a hotshot startup. Is the company behind CyanogenMod suable? If not, Google is the one which will be picked. Point- like, <laughs> their pockets will be picked if a problem happens. Okay, all right, but let's be fair. Microsoft's no dummy. Like, they're throwing down cold 70 million to Cyanogen. And it's obvious to help leverage, you know, they want to help leverage a little control over Android. They want, or at least pay a little bit. Like, if you make Cyan- Cyanogen could develop to be a real contender, where maybe a few OEMs ship with Android, uh, Cyanogen flavor by default, uh, you know, whatever happens, Google would have to maybe at least acknowledge them to a degree and sort of acquiesce to some degree. But it, it seems like. At the end of the day, Android is always going to be under Google's thumb. Major releases are still pushed forward by Google, right? Cyanogen is taking what Google drops. Does the OnePlus have a lollipop officially? I know the beta is out, but it's not actually officially released for the OnePlus right now, right? They're always going to be a step behind. So I still Isn't don't... there more builds of Cyanogen mod when it comes to the hardware versus Google's original images? Yeah. If that's the case, they could just alter their updater and have it point to a Cyanogen mod server. Then they could just bypass Google's control, or at least Google's willingness to not control the updates and let the carriers do the updates. If Cyanogen mod takes back the power of doing the updates on the devices, they could be a good contender here. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that'd be a that'd Because be a Google just gave away all yeah. the, like, the open sourceness of it. They said, screw updates, sell it, you carriers deal with it. And they just gave up, and they don't really do the updates. They let the carriers do it, other than their official phone. You know, if I was Cyanogen, I might I might have gone a different route with the OnePlus. I might have made it like a super, super premium phone that was so hard to get because it was so expensive and so high-end, and build up this mystique brand around the Cyanogen version of Android, and then license it to like manufacturers or carriers to put on their devices to sell as a sweet high-end phone with this with the high-end version of Android which has self-updating uh, you know some of the cyanogen improvements which are legitimately better over the stock Android you know I don't know it it would be interesting to see if they could come across now as a premium version of Android what do you think Zwijar what about that fragmentation I I think it's really all about uh trying to fragment Android in terms of um if you just create another Android player in the market and they take a few percentage points away from Google, it creates leverage for Microsoft in the markets, especially if you say in the developing world. You could say, I took a few percent, percentage points away from Android towards this other OS. Now I have this leverage against Google that's like, well, we can push forward, we can pull back, we can do whatever we need to do uh, as long as you want to play ball with us. And I think that's where Microsoft is looking to move their leverage because I think Windows Phone didn't do what it needed to do. Right. And they're looking at Cyanogen like Samsung looks at Tizen. This may be our way to have leverage over Google since Windows Phone, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, I think you just nailed it. I think you just nailed yeah, it. Yeah, this definitely strikes me as the enemy of my enemy as my friend. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty clever. You know, Microsoft's getting, Microsoft's clever in its old age. They're still, they still uh, make a few good punches here and there. And I bet Google saw that 70 million. But damn it, Microsoft. You know, I bet Google wasn't too happy. So there's always, that's probably worth a few million for Sache right there. Uh, all right, Mr. Sis, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, I'm, I, I know this topic's probably uh, floating around. I think maybe we'll talk more about this on Linux Unplugged tomorrow, too. The Raspberry Pi 2, like a supercharged Raspberry Pi goes on sale. For $35, 900 megahertz, quad-core, ARM Cortex, A7 CPU, somewhere in the 3 to 6 per, to X performance, 1 gigabyte of RAM, that's twice the memory. Uh, and uh, what I love about it is the same form factor as the old Raspberry Pi. And because it has an ARM7 processor, you could run full on like uh, Snappy Ubuntu Core or, as what's getting a lot of attention, Windows 10. Yeah, this strikes me as uh, not too much, but a little too late. Um, the For one, 
the Odroid uh, C1 that's out, that has been out for several months, is the same form factor as the B+, plus, has a 1.5 gigahertz quad-core processor, hmm. and also has a gigabit NIC on it. Now, ARM itself... The chip that's on there can't do a full gigabit, but it will do probably around four or five hundred. Um, whereas the Raspberry Pi two is still the hundred megabit and is only a nine hundred megahertz quad core. Yeah, I was disappointed to see only hundred megabit on the NIC two. I was hoping for a gigabit. I know that sounds silly, but uh, the reason why that's really nice is these have potential to make pretty good perimeter devices, but that uh, NIC is is a limiter. Yes, and I also kind of question the business. Uh, I, it seems kind of odd to me that they just came out with the B plus yeah. a couple months ago, so everybody rushed out and bought them. Right, and you know, companies started making cases because the design is a little different. And then, okay, now we're going to drop the the Raspberry Pi two, which realistically is what the B plus should have been. Yeah. So everyone went out to buy the new device because it, you know they haven't come out with one for so long. We thought that was it. And everybody spent a whole bunch of money, and then, oh, here's the actual device you actually wanted. Now you can go out and buy this one, too. Now, okay, so that's the criticism. Now, all that said, it, I think that the brand, the Raspberry Pi brand, is, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's the, when, it, when you think of a device like this, this is what everybody thinks about. This is always the device you hear about. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that Windows 10 is going to run on this thing. Is this a threat to Linux? Is this a big concern? Anybody have any thoughts on that? I have thoughts from... But- from my understanding, it's going to be a cut-down version of Windows 10. It is not going to be the actual regular Windows 10 that you would get on your desktop or a laptop or even a netbook. Right. Um, so this is from, again, this is just from my understanding that this is actually going to be cut down more than like what we saw before with like the Windows 7 starter editions on netbooks. So with that, I don't think it's going to take that much away from any of the Linux ARM distributions simply because of software availability. Right, there way more software. There isn't really right? any yeah. ARM software for Windows. So way more software. So people are going to have to go out and create that. The, uh, the, the, Linux, the, uh, the ARM Linux rigs have been around for ages now, so the software ecosystem is way more mature. The operating system itself on the platform is way more mature. So not only is Windows 10 going to be a slimmed down version, but the app selection is going to be super weak. And what, are you going to run IIS on a, on a, on a Raspberry Pi? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think that would be I a good idea. <laughs> I think it's an attempt by Windows to try to get into the that marketplace. Yeah. But really, I think they would be better off focused on some of the smaller x86 boards that you can get, right. that mini ITX, if they focus specifically on that. Because you can go to you know, places right now like Newegg, and you can get a small x86 Celeron board. You need to buy RAM for it, but you can get the whole board for around fifty bucks. I know, yeah, that that was where I would be focusing too. Bentley, I wanted to give you a chance to chime in because you are a little concerned about what it means for Linux and open source. You think maybe if it's Windows, that means people are going to take the easy choice? It sounds a lot like the first step in Microsoft's whole embrace, extend, extinguish thing, and especially if teachers are going to be using it in a classroom, they might be more likely to go with something they know, even if it's not as good for the students. And just speaking from experience, I know Linux is so much easier to learn about computers and learn about development than Windows has ever been. Well, the, where Microsoft could really, you know, take advantage of the fact that they're a big, huge corporation with deep pockets is they could buy up a bunch of these and, like, actually put some marketing behind a program and roll them out to schools with Windows preloaded. But remember, at the end of the day, it's just, a, it's just an SD card. You pop out the SD card and you put on the Linux one and you're good to go. Yeah, well, I think teachers might see the windows and just go with it because that's what they know how to use. And then the students go, don't get too much of an option. Yeah. Eric, you want to... Chris, I also... Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. You can let Eric go first. Okay, Eric, I'll go first. Eric, okay. Have it. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. I'll go. <laughs> I, I think the other thing that this might be able to be used for is that Microsoft might be seeing this as sort of a way to get into the thin client market with a new device that's dirt cheap. Hmm. Or point of sales too. That's why they should invest in this. Eric, what were you going to say? I was just going to say the embrace, extend, extinguish model was a Balmer era thing, and we are clearly seeing a day from Microsoft. At least I hope we are, because really I am tired of the whole embrace, extend, extinguish the model that they had, and everybody using that as a way of saying, "Oh, look, Microsoft is evil." Well, proof. It's in the pudding as far as I'm concerned. We're going to see... Uh, it's a wait-and-see right. thing. We'll, we'll see, see what happens. Yeah. 
Nadella's done a lot of things to go more towards the open source, but there is in no way, any way, he could ever extinguish Linux just because the way it is. So, uh, Sibojar, uh, do you think it doesn't matter what Microsoft does? you think it's all about the experience? What do you mean? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, it, the levels of playing field, if it's exactly the same way you install Windows 10 as you do Linux, like if you still have to write to an SD card, it's just as easy to do either one. If Windows 10 runs poorly on such you know hardware that's at that level, which there's a good chance it will, then you are going to say, well, that levels the playing field even more. And I think that it isn't quite the threat that some might think it'd be only because you have, you say, oh, it's got Windows 10. It may not be the threat only because if the experience isn't there, that's really what people go for for Windows. They say, oh, it's a wonderful experience that I know. And if it's if it doesn't meet that, then people are going to be put off. And I think yeah. you don't have as much of a threat to the Linux side of things. You know, I'm 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 so you know, this being Coda Radio, I'm thinking about it from like a, I'm a developer and say I want to target uh, a range of devices. Here's what I would know. Here's what I would look at from a market standpoint. The the like uh, Q5 was saying, the Raspberry Pi B plus just sold a whole bunch of units, and all of the models that are out, all of the I mean, so many models that are out of the original Raspberry Pi, those are all Linux based. And those are all going to continue to exist. They're going to run for a very long time because they're very solid little devices. Uh, there's no moving parts. They're going to continue to operate. They're going to continue to run applications for a very long time. They're going to be part of this Internet of Things mix, just doing different jobs. They're going to be the glue that holds a lot of this stuff together. And that's all going to be Linux. So when these Raspberry Pi 2 start shipping, you're going to have the momentum of all of the established devices already in the market that already run Linux, not to mention the world outside of the Raspberry Pi. There's so much momentum for the Linux platform for these devices that Windows is going to be a one-off specialty thing and it's no way it can be the majority because it's just too late so if i'm a developer and i'm writing applications for these things if i'm going to create some of that glue i'm targeting linux on these things yeah microsoft's arm support has just been with visual studio 2013 i believe their c plus plus compiler just started spitting out arm code yeah and you know their javascript engine is just going on arm code but yeah. linux has been on arm for years probably right. a decade right yeah yeah, and, and a go go. I know you just got in here. And you wanted to give a mention to the GUI, the power of the GUI, my friend. Uh, I have a feeling the Windows, the Windows the Aero environment, and probably the Windows A environment, is quite heavy. And I have a feeling mm. Windows 10 will be very resource intensive on the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, they might have to run in classic mode because it is going to be a pared down version. So this is another thing, and I don't mean to be, I'm not trying to bash on Microsoft, because I do want to acknowledge right here, I think I think maybe one of the few places it probably will be very successful is, unfortunately, but I think to Microsoft's credit, in education. I think there's going to be areas where it's useful. Uh, it could also be a great way to have a Windows experience with a few, you know, must-have Windows applications if they're ported, and maybe not have to worry as much about x86 malware. I don't know. Could be totally wrong on that. But what I, what I worry about when I, when I see this is... Not so much the momentum there, but I think prob pro probably the primary thing is the primary thing the Windows use is going to be is very minimal. It's going to be it's going to be just a small little a niche area, and I think that's fine. I don't think there's really going to be much of a problem with it. I might even try it out just to see what it looks like. But my bet is, is this isn't going to game changer. No, despite I mean now, today, so we're recording this episode Monday, February second, two thousand fifteen, and the tech press is going crazy with the story this morning. So right now it seems like a very big deal as we record this episode. Uh, Q5. I, I like want to give you hardware. But oh, go ahead. Hans. I don't think the Windows. Oh, I don't think the Windows will be very much popular on the Raspberry Pi, even if it is a lot more powerful, powerful in terms of hardware. But the new hardware, that's always good, especially when it comes from a known name like a Raspberry Pi. Yes, uh, and uh, uh, Subajar, I'll let you get the last word on this. Well, I was just going to say that I think this really benefits the Raspberry Pi Foundation much more than, than it probably will ever benefit Microsoft. I mean, what you described is basically it's a good desktop computer for your for your grandma and grandpa who don't want to get viruses. Mm. Well, that's not really a, a good market to go at. Whereas Raspberry Pi now can say, well, you could run Windows. So people are like, well, I could try it out. Or if, I want, if I'm a developer, I could go to it and say, I have a Windows 10 machine without getting all crazy about having to worry about, you know, you buying a machine and having Windows 10 on it. I could just test it out on my Raspberry Pi and see what it's like. And I I think that's where, like, the Raspberry Pi Foundation will sell more Raspberry Pis. I mean, I have an intention of buying one in the near future myself. Um, but I think Microsoft isn't going to get quite the traction that they are going to hope out of this. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, okay. Oh. I, oh. 
I also wonder how easy will the GPI opens be able to be accessed on Windows? Because that's yeah. what people mainly use yeah. for Raspberry Pi 4. That's actually kind of a sticky point on Linux because um, there are ways to access them without being root, but they don't uh, work that well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I suppose I suppose that would be interesting to see if a class of hardware devices are written around Windows to interact with this. I, that I I will be curious to see if that crops up. I guess we'll wait. I guess we'll wait and see. And okay, any last thoughts before we move on? Going once. Yeah, one quick. Yep. One quick one, Chris. Um, I Microsoft is known for planning things again, not Balmer area, but planning things out very long term. I. I have a hard time believing that Microsoft is looking at this as a Raspberry Pi 2 option only. I think right. that's initially what we're going to get, yeah. but I fully expect that they're going to start working in for older versions of Raspberry Pi so that they can leverage the entire yeah. market and not just the new one. Like typical, though, we don't really know. You know, They announce before we have all the details, before we have any code to download, as usual. But, yep, I agree. We will find out. Uh, all right, guys. Well, thanks for the insights on that. I thought that'd be one you have something to uh, to say. You know, uh, there's a topic we've kicked around for a long time on the Coda Radio program, and that's the downward pressure on pricing making of, of software, making it difficult for indie developers to pull a profit and also trying to strike a balance. Uh, well, Zachariah, I think is how I'm going to say that, wrote in. He said, I just listened to episode 137 in which you guys talked about mobile app sales and prices. I was reminded of a book that I recently read, Free. The Future of Radical Price. It's available on Audible, and he says, I really recommend it to inform or stimulate your thoughts and discussions about pricing and software. Here's the best part. It's free. So that's cool. I'll just play like a couple of seconds of it because I started listening to it earlier, and, and then I actually got pretty wrapped up into it. Free. The Future of a Radical Price by Chris Anderson. That's me. Prologue. In November 2008, the surviving members of the original Monty Python team, stunned by the extent of digital piracy of their videos, issued a very stern announcement on YouTube. For three years, you YouTubers have been ripping us off, taking tens of thousands of our videos and putting them on YouTube. Now the tables are turned. It's time for us to take matters into our own hands. We know who you are, we know where you live, and we could come after you in ways too horrible to tell. But being the extraordinary nice chaps we are, we figured a better way to get our own back. We've launched our own Monty Python channel on YouTube. No more of those crap quality videos you've been posting. We're giving you the real thing. High quality videos delivered straight from our vault. What's more, we're taking our most viewed clips and uploading brand new high quality versions. And what's even more, we're letting you see absolutely everything for free. So there. But we want something in return. None of your driveling, mindless comments. Instead, we want you to click on the links, buy our movies and TV shows, and soften our pain and disgust at being ripped off all these years. Three months later, the results of this rash experiment with free were in. Monty Python's DVDs had climbed to number two on Amazon's movie and TV bestsellers list with increased sales of 23,000%. Wow. So there. So there. So you can listen to the whole thing for free. Uh, we'll have it linked in uh, the show notes. And if uh, you sign up, it is an affiliate link, I think. So if you sign up, I think Jupiter Broadcasting gets a cut, but I don't know exactly how that – I don't know how much that really impacts it. Uh, so you'll find links to that in the show notes. And again, that was uh, free, the future of the, a radical price. I'm sure you could find it in print or in an ebook somewhere too. And that was sent in by Zachariah. Thank you, Zachariah, for sending that in. That was actually quite good. And since it's free, I'm going to grab it. Because, uh, I mean, I have an Audible account already. I like the book recommendations from time to time. You know, we like to get your emails, too. So go over to Jupiter Broadcasting, click the contact link, choose Coda Radio from the dropdown, send in your book picks, or engage in our subreddit. We like to check that all throughout the week, and it's a great way to kind of put all of the Coda Radio stuff in one spot when we're getting doing show prep, too. CodaRadio.reddit.com. Stories you think we might want to talk about, discussion, threads, applications you think we might want to feature. Book picks are also welcome there, too. Coda Radio dot reddit.com mumble room anybody in there have anything you want to touch on before you wrap up any last words i don't want the uh credit and the, the credits to end and then somebody go oh i really wish i would have said because that happens sometimes with you guys can i go back to the pie yeah one last yeah so i don't think it's as simple as losing linux to windows but the whole goal of the raspberry pi foundation has been to try to get kids you know into programming their goal isn't to make like the Right. Cheap computer for industrial use. Right. And I think the way they cut it is no matter what the operating system, it's a gain for kids to be able to program and on them. 
Wow. Way to end it on a high note, dude. That's a great point. Ever in that in that regard, at least the kids win. And you know what we always say here at Coda Radio? Uh we we always say, yeah, you should probably think of I think we always say you should you should think of the kids. I think. All right, nice point. Very good. Well, uh, we wish our best to uh, Mr. Dominic, who is stuck in a train somewhere. I don't know if he's able to listen in. That would have been kind of cool. He'll be back next week. We do this show live on a Monday over jblive.tv. We do it at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted to your local time zone. You can find me on Twitter, twitter.com slash chrislas, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact, and coderadio.reddit.com. Just want to tell you about all that. And also, I don't mention it all the time. But you know about RSS, don't you? We got RSS feeds. You can go grab them and then subscribe, and you just get the show automatically every single week. It's like podcast magic. It's a series of tubes, baby. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Coda Radio. See you right back here next week. Mm-hmm.